So um, this is chapter four from Communicating for Results, a Canadian student's guide written by Carolyn Meyer from Oxford University Press. So um, I'm going to break down the chapters that we're going through. You'll have to bear with me because I'm, I'm creating my own PowerPoints. Oxford University Press doesn't seem to offer any. So these are um, created by me. So it's a little bit time consuming, but also um, because they've they've stopped carrying the fourth edition and the fifth edition is $100. Like I think it's 110 or 120. So it's just very expensive. Um, this chapter is broken down into three parts and it's word choice, conciseness and tone. So I'm just going to work my way through the, um, the chapter. I may read off of the slides. Um, I didn't like type the entire chapter in, but I tried to type in highlights that I thought would be helpful. So um, what they're saying when it comes to word choice is a plain style. The need for clear, understandable, concrete language is not unique to the age of high-speed communication, they write. Centuries ago, when people first began to write for science and business and industry, demands were heard for the kind of simplicity and economy that is now the hallmark of plain style or plain language. Plain style makes it acceptable for you to write in the same everyday language that you use when you speak and helps you to reach your readers instead of putting your audience at a distance. So what they're suggesting here is what I've highlighted, use common everyday words except for necessary technical terms. Uh, use language that you are familiar with and that you find accessible. So they're asking that you um, work against pretension. Use reasonable sentence lengths. So aim for, they suggest 20 words or fewer to avoid padding or needlessly overloading your sentences. Use the active voice and phrasal verbs. This will become clearer as we go over grammar, but the active voice is a um, verb that does action. So by action, I mean that they show who or what is performing an action. Um, combining verbs and prepositions to deliver their meaning. Um, for example, work out instead of devise. Always place the subject as close as possible to the verb. Your subject is normally going to be a noun or a pronoun, often um, a person, place, or a thing. The meaning of a sentence relies on the clear relationship between its subject and its verb. So um, what they're suggesting here is um, basically create very simple, plain sentences um, to avoid like very long, confusing sentences where it's unclear who you're talking about or what is happening. Uh, they suggest that you rely on personal pronouns such as I, you, we, um, and they, they're saying that um, this lets you say what you need to say with minimal awkwardness. So um, they go on to say use clear, unambiguous language. And ambiguity is just referring to an exact expression that has multiple meanings. And I've given you this little drawing, this way, that way, another way. They talk about vagueness. Vagueness is similar to ambiguity, but makes it difficult for readers to form any sort of an interpretation. Um, like for example, the re report is due soon, but no one knows what that actually means. So sometimes the word you use may not completely or accurately describe a thought, or the thought itself may defy easy expression, or the thought itself may not be fully formed enough to be expressed and understood. What they're saying is know what you're saying, say it as easily as you can. So um, if you don't know when the report is due, uh, it might be helpful and, and you're responsible for that, 
or you're not like if you if you don't know when the report is due you can always ask so that you can put in a date if there's um, uncertainty just overall like no one knows then actually say say that the report is will be due the due date is not known at this time but i will keep you posted or something like that i use familiar words um, and again they're just talking about um pretentious the, the i i refer to it as an elevated language um often people think that they're supposed to speak a certain way in a certain situation and sometimes we are supposed to speak certain ways in certain situations um, but you want to be careful not to sound uh, pretentious or like a, a, a slang way of saying that is stuck up or arrogant. Uh, you want to avoid jargon filled business and our technical language um, just because it can be difficult to understand. And here in the, the little little cartoon I gave you, what language is he speaking? And the woman tells this guy English. And then they say, like, to help with these unfamiliar words or um, to avoid unfamiliar words is to um, watch when you're using words that are ending in I-Z-E or I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. And they tell you that verbs ending in I-Z-E and nouns ending in I-Z-A-T-I-O-N may sound rich and sophisticated, but they can also lead to an inflated heavy-handed style that grinds comprehension to a halt. So some words that fit this category, such as privatize, hospitalize, unionize, maximize, authorization, and specialization are common enough to use without compromising readability. So that's, I think, really important, um, that the words you're using are not compromising readability. That so long as what you write is readable and understandable, that that's what you, we're looking for. So they suggest that you avoid foreign words and our phrases. Uh, this is probably more common than you're aware. Uh, so some of the words that they're suggesting uh, you avoid are French derivatives, such as converse, and in its place, use the word talk or the phrase have a conversation. A French derivative is a prize, and they are suggesting that you just use the plain English tell or inform. And a French derivative is commence, and your textbook suggests that you replace that with begin or start. And they go on to suggest that you use only job related jargon and jargon is the special vocabulary for a group trade profession or sphere of activity and terminology of this kind is essential for conducting business and describing sophisticated concepts and activities accurately and concisely and jargon is as they write permissible when it is purposeful and transparent because jargon is a private language of the inner circle, anyone who uses it must be sure that its special terms, abbreviations, and acronyms will be mutually understood. So what they're saying is here is if you are using jar jargon, make sure that it is related to your actual job and also make sure that when you're using it, everyone in the room or everyone you're speaking to or writing to will know what that jargon means. If not, replace it with words or a word that is understandable by everyone. And they're suggesting that um, buzzwords are fashionable, often technical sounding pieces of jargon known as trendy attention getters buzzwords sound fresh current and suitably corporate their trendiness is part of their appeal but it is also a large part of their drawback because they tend to go out of style quite quickly often through overuse so um, there are a, a lot of buzzwords and um, they give us a list here synergy globalize paradigm shift solutioning 
blue sky thinking. Um, I was unaware of the blue sky thinking, which is brainstorming unhindered by concern for limitations. So they are suggesting that you use fresh and current language to stay competitive today's business, explore and implement progressive approaches and technologies. So they're saying that because businesses to stay competitive must always be exploring and implementing new and progressive approaches and technologies that it then makes sense that they want to use contemporary modern language that reflects and reinforces those aims and creates a corporate image that is modern and up to date. Uh, replace cliches. Cliches are descriptive expressions that have been drained of meaning through overuse. Once vibrant and full of impact, they are now trite. Unless a cliche adds uniqueness or by way of an analogy sums up something that is otherwise impossible to describe, replace it with fresh and direct language. And then they've given us some of the better known business cliches. Uh, tighten our belts, true to form, all over the map, rest assured, a change for the better going forward without further delay. Um, I'm still hearing a lot of this one outside the box, which I do feel is um, really trite now and so overused, uh, as is push the envelope. Um, so they're, they are suggesting that you avoid and replace these words and phrases with, some, with something fresher. Keep language specific, precise, and functional. So to do this, you need to use concrete nouns. And what they're just saying is a concrete noun is um, a noun that is, okay, for example, table. A table is a concrete noun. Love is an abstract noun. Sad, abstract. Integrity, loyalty. These are abstract concepts. So they're asking when you are able, you need to either clarify that abstract noun or replace it with a concrete noun. And their example is, our company demands loyalty. Much clearer is Starbucks Coffee Corporations expects employee loyalty to corporate policy. And it is, wordier, but it's actually clearer. They go on to say that you must or you should quantify facts and avoid qualitative statements. So for example, um, they're saying that this sentence is vague. They received some complaints about it some time ago, and it is vague. Um, who's they? what are the complaints about, and when were they received. So that's actually a, a very um, problematic sentence. And then they give an example of a specific sentence, our customer service representatives received 36 complaints, not complaints, complaints about Model G500 in 2015. And then they go on to write, uh, to write and indicate that you should practice factual and ethical communication. So um, they are asking you as a person in the workforce to be reasonable, to rely on facts, and to be tolerant in your judgments, to consider the impact your communication, whether it's written, uh, body language, or spoken, and be aware of the impact that it has on others as well as yourself. And they also suggest consult qualified colleagues, um, which I think is actually really nice. I don't think people normally want to do that. I'm not sure why I don't, I don't think people are very comfortable asking for help. And I think it's quite all right to ask for help. Um, and they are saying avoid libelous language. And that's just libelous language is that language you can be sued for 
or your company can be sued for. So um, common law protects every person against libel, printed character defamation. Um, harmful and potentially libelous words include drunk, lazy, crazy, crooked, corrupt, incompetent, stupid, maniac, drug addict, and thief. So um, incredibly judgmental words. Be timely and accurate in your communication. So um, if you are delaying, it should be for a very good reason. Um, of course, avoid untrue, deceptive, or misleading statements. So um, when you write, say, or say something, it should be accurate to the best of your knowledge. And um, it should not be misleading. Know what you can and cannot disclose to certain parties. So this is just, um, you should be aware of your corporate disclosure practices and confidentiality agreements um, and handle your organization's intellectual property with care. Uh, depending on where you're working, you will often have to sign confidentiality agreements. Distinguish between fact and opinion. I think this is a really difficult one. I think most of us want to think for some reason that an opinion ha is by some magical merit a fact. And uh, many people present their opinions as if they are fact. So um, a, an opinion is just a belief system. Um, sometimes it's a guess, sometimes it's conjecture. Um, it's often unprovable. And passing off your opinion as fact is uh, misleading and unethical. Of course, don't claim authorship of documents you have not written. Uh, even in the workforce, always be careful to acknowledge uh, where, if, if you've obtained a piece of information from some other document, always be careful to acknowledge and cite it. So the second part of this chapter is conciseness. And this section opens with uh, this paragraph. It may come as no surprise that the origin of the term business is busyness. Time constraints and pressing deadlines are the norm for most business people. Therefore, readers expect to receive workplace documents get, that get to the point directly with an economy of words and a minimum of clutter. So they're basically saying, get to your point when you're writing as efficiently and politely as possible. Uh, and they have given an example. Um, this is the original example that they then revise. This is just a very brief memo to inform you that it is the opinion of the employee council that at the present time it is expedient to undertake an investigation of the possible institution of a proposed on-site fitness center. Kindly be advised that any time up to August 31st, you should make your views known to your employee council representative. So that is um, very long-winded. Their revised example is the employee council invites your input on the proposed creation of an on-site fitness center. Please call and talk to your employee council representative before August 31st. Uh, so they've cut it down to two sentences. Uh, I, I think that often people write long, um, indirect ways of expressing themselves because sometimes they think they're actually just nervous. And um, it's kind of a way of, I think it's almost a, a defense or a protection mechanism. Uh, and please be aware there's a balance to achieve between concise and polite as opposed to concise and abrupt. So, and here's an example, Wordy, please note that you are requested to read and offer your comments on the attached file. Terse, which is very abrupt, read this, get back to me. And the concise and polite. So the ideal is this concise and polite. Please review and comment on the attached file. So they are suggesting to um, get your writing concise, consider eliminating those long lead-ins, which I think are normal for a first draft. But, um, you know, after that, like, kind of cut them. 
uh, revise those noun conversions, find um, a more direct way of saying it, eliminate redundancies, eliminate or revise empty words and phrases, use strong and active verbs, write in the active voice when possible, revise wordy prepositional phrases. I'm sorry, they talk about so much grammar. Eliminate fillers, shorten multiple that which who clauses, combine multiple short sentences and reduce clauses and phrases. So then I've just given you um, PowerPoints from the book that, that indicate that. So for example, eliminate long lead-ins, and then there's a wordy example and a concise one. And I'm not gonna read out everything because I know you guys can read. Revise noun conversions. Replace the phrase with the verb. So they've given you a noun conversion phrase, and then they're offering you the verb in its place. Eliminate redundancies and eliminate or revise empty words and phrases. So, and again, they've given you, um, like for example, on the eliminate redundancies, uh, you do not need, um, absolutely, you do not need past, you do not re need reiterate, uh, you can cut refer, you can cut enter, necessary imperative visual cooperation. <laughs> Um, I think that just even um, maybe keep imperative, um, identical, and you could use each or every, but you don't need them both. So you could use just each or every. Um, eliminate or revise empty words and phrases, and then they've given you the example here. Use strong and active verbs. So uh, use a verb in place of a verb phrase. So um, cut all intensifiers and qualifiers. And then they give you a list. Revise wordy prepositional phrases. And again, um, there's a definition here. And then um, an example, eliminate fillers, I mean they can be useful if you, if, if extreme politeness is required, otherwise you can get rid of them. Shorten multiple that which who clauses, and then they've given you uh, examples here. And of course, remember, you can, of course, pause your little MP4 movie and read this if I'm going too quickly. Combine multiple short sentences and reduce clauses and phrases. And again, they're giving you some uh, definition of pronouns and um, how to re reduce sentences to clauses, clauses to phrases, and phrases to single words. And then you watch how they take this one wordy sentence and um, just keep rewriting it until it's very concise. The third and last section for this chapter four is tone. So tone offer opens with this uh, beginning paragraph. Um, read between the lines of almost any business message and it is possible to detect the writer's frame of mind inklings of demand or respect, arrogance or modesty, or indifference or concerns. This impression is a product of tone. And tone is the implied attitude of the author to the subject, whatever they're writing about, um, to the reader, or sometimes to both. So um, the first thing they ask is that you pay attention to connotation and um, denotation. Connotation is a word's implied or associative meaning. Often it's colored by emotions. 
um, like so for example cheap inexpensive cost effective low price thrifty economical and which one might be the best to use so cheap is um, has a lot of connotations to it that not only is it inexpensive but it's undesirable um, cost effective low priced thrifty has a different kind of connotation economical um, i would even toss out words like frugal uh, miserly so implied meaning has the power to shape perceptions so um, they definitely want you to pay attention to that uh, select the right level of formality be positive so um, and they say that this can be achieved in writing negative attitude you cannot use the online training system until you've been issued a password positive attitude you may begin using the online training system once you receive your password and um, of course they talk about being polite and well-mannered so um, which is awkward that you know that they're even talking about that in a textbook so be aware of that uh, particularly at work um, with obviously colleagues but also clients and uh, then um, to get to this slide that I've actually indicated some things on use inclusive language use only gender neutral job titles and salutations salutations is just a greeting as in dear sir or madam um, to whom it may concern um, you know names if you can is better use gender neutral pronouns use respectful and accurate language use definite forward-looking language don't make unnecessary apologies uh, use strong assertive phrasing be knowledgeable and informative and guard against overconfidence so um, you don't want to um, look as if you're so confident it is coming across as arrogance so for example um, here's uh, the ideal my experience in marketing and additional background in public relations have prepared me for this challenging position as opposed to you will undoubtedly agree that my marketing genius makes me more than qualified for the job so that's an example of how to guard against um, overconfidence so be modest but don't sell yourself short be knowledgeable and informative uh, that they're asking that you know your subject that you know your job that you know your work that you know what you're talking about um, and that you know the information you're trying to get across. Uh, use strong assertive phrasing rather than what they call weasel words. Deferential and well-intentioned phrases such as I hope and I trust can sometimes sound weak and tentative. With over overused phrases such as perhaps if you have time, maybe if it's not too much trouble, if you could possibly, or I find it probable, that can slowly drain the power and assertiveness from your writing. So um, if you feel the need to use them, use them sparingly. Don't make unnecessary apologies. Uh, I am so sorry to have to ask you to confirm the time and the location of our next meeting. Instead, please confirm the time and location of our next meeting. Also be aware that um, there was a study done. I don't know. I don't remember who did it or if it's even a study or just a kind of a, a sort of idea of Canadians. But apparently Canadians say sorry a lot. I've heard this a lot while traveling. So for if you're Canadian, you might really need to work on that. Uh, use definite forward looking um, language such as uh, two courses in risk management for my recently completed MBA degree will allow me to contribute to your mutual funds division. 
as opposed to, although I might not have as much experience as the other applicants, I did take a few courses in risk management while trying to complete the requirements of my MBA. Um, use respectful, accurate language. I think, I think you know the rest of those, so I'm not going to go over them. If you don't, please email me and um, I, will, I will make sure that I give you definitions. So that is the conclusion of chapter four. Um, I will post it right away and then move on to the other material to um, get PowerPoints and recordings and get it up for you. Um, okay, I hope you have a good Monday. Bye.